Are you able to talk about how you got financing for the film? Or? It's, it was pretty straightforward. Once we had the script and the sizzle done, actually I had pitched Okay, let me, let, me, let me rewind. So when Stefan, the writer, and I started working on the script and the sizzle, I, uh, I had lunch with a producer friend of mine. And um, I just briefly gave him the log line. And he's like, oh my God, that's awesome. When you're done, let me see it. And uh, we're, we're good friends. Um, and uh, we go back a few years. Also someone I met through a friend that I went to school with, obviously. But so when we were all done, um, my managers sent it out to a few people, a few companies, and I sent it to my producer friend, uh, Chatty, and um, he loved it. And at the, how did that go? Because he, he had produced the pyramid for Fox, and so he was in Lebanon at the time that I sent him this stuff, because, the, because uh, it was the Middle Eastern premiere of the pyramid. And um, at the same time that he was there, this other movie called Pocket Listing also premiered in Lebanon. That one was produced by the people that ended up financing Danger One. So just because, and so because Chaddy, my producer friend, was in um, Lebanon at the time, he decided to go to the premiere of Pocket Listing. And uh, that's how he met the financiers and they had just finished the movie and they were looking for something new and they told him what they were looking for and uh, Chatty, he was like, oh my God, you should check this out. I got a sizzle and a script. And um, at that point, like things, things moved pretty fast. Like we probably spent two months on like rewriting the script for them. And probably five months later, we were, we were on set. Yeah. <laughs> so you put your own money for the sizzle and then in the end, you got someone to finance the film. Yeah, yeah I completely. wouldn't be able to finance. On, a, on an editor's salary, you're not going to be able to finance a film this size. Yeah. Oh, that's um, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, our budget wasn't high, especially for a movie uh, this ambitious. And, you know, it was a full union shoot. But, uh, yeah, we, we, got it, we got it done. You think it being mostly interior of, or just in that one warehouse, whatever, with the, with the ambulance? That that saved a lot of money, so you're not doing too oh, many. Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't know how we got this done with the time we had and, and the budget. Um, it's a bit of a, 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 a miracle, and in hindsight, I, I do think it would have been good if we had. And I know every director will tell you that we had a little bit more, um, but uh, we still had a whole lot of locations that we had to cover in 23 days. So for us to be able to spend the first, I think we spent the first two weeks of those 23 days in that warehouse, um, basically covering everything that happens in the warehouse and also inside the ambulance was um, it's the only way to get that done. And then for the last, the next two weeks, that's when we kind of, you know, head out. But we still had so many locations where it's like you have a, a company move in the middle of the day, you're doing one scene here and then everyone gets in their cars and their trucks and you travel somewhere else. It's yeah, but we also kind of, I guess a, a lot of the scenes we sort of shot right around that warehouse. The funny thing is like there's a scene in the movie where they're uh, getting rid of the firefighter's body in the manhole. Um, and we were looking for a location for that. So when we were in the warehouse, the warehouse was actually a terrible place. It's, we use it as a sound, sound stage. It should not be used as a sound stage because <laughs> Once it, sound stages are soundproof, right? That makes them a sound stage. This is just an old warehouse, but what's worse is literally right next to that warehouse uh, was a recycling plant. Oh no. So we're shooting inside this warehouse and all night long, all day long, you've got like these contain trucks pushing containers with metal cans and bottles against our wall, which is why a lot of the sound was unusable and we had to ADR a lot of it. Oh. But we were like, well, that's, can we go take a look at this recycling plant? Maybe we can shoot there. And that's, we eventually ended up shooting a whole scene in there, literally just next door. Yeah. So you, when, when you found out that a lot of the sound wasn't usable, like how shocking was that? Maybe you knew that was coming? Or then... yeah, well, we, I mean, we know it was coming because we heard it on set. Once we, I mean, it was not a good situation to be in. You, you don't want to, especially on a low budget film, you don't want to have to ADR half your movie. But a lot of the stuff that happened in there, yeah, we had to, we had to ADR. 
in, in post. We had a long ADR schedule on this movie. How long did that set you back? Because you probably had an idea that it was going to be released by a certain time, and then um, it was pretty, the thing is like our um, just because certain things didn't go according to plan during production. A lot of the and this happens on movies. A lot of the post production budget kind of moved into production. So when you then get to post-production, you have to be really smart. But things will just take longer because there's now less money to get it done than there was before. So our, um, our post, oh my God, how long, how long was that? Because we shot in 2016 in March and April. And I think the movie was done. I don't know, it was, were we in post for like a year? Probably. Because at some point actors are also you know out of town shooting new things, so it's like you have to start scheduling um, around you know their availability. Just like the further removed that gets from the actual from principal photography, the harder it gets. But yeah, I think I think we were. I mean, we finished. We fin yeah we finished the film towards the in, in fall two thousand and seventeen. So yeah, post was was a year. Did you have all the actors come back in for ADR? Um, all, all the major players? Yeah, I think so. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, Tom Everett Scott was in for like four days. Yeah, even yeah, Dennis O'Hare had to come from New York. We even had some ADR done in Lebanon because the actor was in Lebanon. So it's oh, like wow. he had to like visit a studio there and like, you know, he have a Skype call. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, pretty much all the, all the major players were in for a day, half a day and some of the smaller ones. How does that work? So you've gone through the entire movie and you know from this time marker to this, the sound is horrible and this line needs to be done. So you're charting all that? Uh, well, yeah, I wasn't, but the, um, the, the post sound department, they were, they basically just, and that was the first time I had done that, they basically just give you a long list of like, here's the time code, here's the line, get this line. The good thing about it is it actually allows you to um, tweak the performance a little bit too. Now I know a lot of actors don't like ADR and I get it because you're in a booth and it doesn't feel, you know, being on set, there's the environment and you can really get into it. You've got an, uh, the other character in front of you. You're, you're having an actual interaction. It allows you to, you know, get out of your head and really just get, be in that moment. ADR, you're in a padded, tiny booth by yourself. Like the acting just becomes, the acting experience becomes very artificial you're just saying the line over and over again in a loop. So a lot of actors hate doing it. As a director or just for the, the post crew, it allowed us to like tweak certain performances, to like even out the tone a little bit, you know, take certain things down a notch, also to actually rewrite certain lines that were off camera. Um, because like scenes might've gotten cut. There's uh, I think a couple scenes that we never even shot. So it's like we had to like, um, you know, somehow get that content in, uh, which ADR is just the best way of doing that. So, you, you know, so it wasn't just replacing crappy production audio. It was also just tweaking the story. So then how, oh, okay, sorry. So how do you get that to, to match, to match the room tone of the bad sound that's in Vernon that probably has a very distinct feel and then you have this pristine booth. How, how is that working? Um, well, I mean, they, during the mix, they, uh, well, we, there's an ADR, um, uh, an ADR editor. So they already do some filtering on it. And then during the mix, you make it, you try to make it sound as much as possible as production. Sometimes um, they just advise you to ADR the whole scene because they're like, we're never going to be able to match this. If you know what lines are ADR, you can tell. Like I hear, when I watch it, I'm like, mm, there's an ADR line right there. I don't know if audiences can, um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's not easy. <laughs> right, so you, you know it just because you know there was more reverb or whatever, you could just hear more of an yeah. echo or something. Yeah. And this was too crisp, but most of the time the audience won't know. Well, now having done it, I can actually also hear it in, in other movies. I would watch a oh. movie, even on like big movies, you're like, that's an ADR line right there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, you have an editor's ear though, so. <laughs> well, I mean, in reality TV, well, I guess we do some of that, but it's, you know, it's not on this level. Like ADR in reality TV is 
talent will say it in their iPhone and record it and then like text it over. It's not done <laughs> on the, it's not quite on the same level as, as on a feature. Sure. But then too, with a lot of reality TV, there's music playing almost the entire time. It seems like yeah. under the, under the, so, so that would probably filter a lot. Uh, yeah, because a lot of it is just wall to wall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, reality TV, you, you do quite a bit of wild lines, mm. you know, like have dialogue cheated underneath that, that people, again, record on their iPhones or like during, during interviews and then you make it, you know, we make it sound like it's actually happening in scene. Yeah, like I said, not, not a lot of reality in reality TV. <laughs> Sure, I mean iPhone audio can sound excellent. So yeah, well, because audio on re in reality TV is already kind of crappy. So like the audio from the iPhone is gonna fit in nice. You Interesting. Know? <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna stand out that much.